It's only entertainment. <laughs> All right, welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. My guest today is Dre Neumann. He's a Chief Creative Officer at Jushi Holdings. Dre, thanks for uh, being back on The Talking Hedge. Good to, good to be here, Josh, and, and good yeah. to see you again. Last time we saw us in Vegas, which was exciting. <laughs> That's right, man. Yeah, um, we were in uh, in Vegas for day one um, on Wednesday that day in a hallway where all the speakers were at, incredibly noisy. And so the audio file for that day, uh, the six or seven people I interviewed was was pretty bad. Yours, unfortunately, was the worst. I had to delete the entire uh, interview. So appreciate you coming back. And, exactly. um, and yeah. Yeah. And on that note, if, if you hear my dogs barking in the background, that is just a part of the listening experience today. Of course. Of course. <laughs> uh drake can you just um you know just repeating i guess the exclusive uh podcast we had just you and i listening the last time <laughs> maybe you can uh tell everybody else though actually what you do for jushi yeah so so i'm i'm the chief creative officer of jushi so i run basically um did all all digital of jushi this includes the e-commerce all the brands we have like six six uh brands in in, in six states um but Tons of SKUs, so uh, from from vapes to uh, flower to pre-roll to now edible. Very cool in Pennsylvania. We just launched some fantastic gummies. The brand is called Tasteology, and so and 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 everything else, which is basically what you see on see uh, see outside from Jushi, like as well all our films and and all our our basic communication and the PR uh, is is done by my department, which is called the creative department. And, and, and this is purposely called like that because we think marketing is not the right word for it. So we're trying to really solve things through creativity in Jushi. And, uh, and there's a lot of content. We think content connects with the people. And like we, we, we put a lot of effort in this. And, um, and, 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 and it's interesting that as well, my, my responsibility is as well very much online driven, right? Because the online is a super, it's a super interesting and super new thing for cannabis, right? You, we, we know like companies like Jane, we're working a lot with, they, they launched not so long ago, right? And, and, and we're, we're, we're great partners and, and we're, making, we're making really history here. It's like online pre-ordering and like uh, now going, going places where nobody could else go before, like, uh, and finding their dispensary, making an order and then picking up at the store at the moment, right? This is, that's, uh, that's what we do. Uh, I want to get into some products and, and storefronts and everything else. We'll, we'll work our way there eventually. But um, I was just looking at this BDS analytics report and it said that th over 36% of consumers listed the location as the reason for their favorite dispensary. And so when I went out to Hello Again, that's one of Jushi's stores in, in Vegas, it was significantly off the storefront. So I can only imagine that that's mostly like locals or whatever in the area. I'm yeah. wondering if you're seeing the same thing at stores where it's all about location and curious how far people are willing to travel. Yeah, I think so. I always paint, draw my circle around six miles around the dispensary. So now this, this depends do you have competition, right? And then with, with, within the six miles, if there's three or four stores, you have this in California, you can have stores next door and stuff. So, yeah. so I think six miles is the magic number. People, it's, it's, like, it's like compared with the local liquor store. You, you go walk there and then it's, it's the closest and you go there and you pick it up. So I think that's it. And then, then of course, uh, where, where it comes to more, uh, I think you can give more sophisticated. If you have special products you're carrying, nobody else has that would be an advantage to put people to bring people to you um or the, the big battle is of course the prices and the promos and that's the sad thing that everybody has the same product uh, all those dispensaries and then you're fighting basically you have this this kind of i call it the death spiral we go down in prices all the time this happens a lot in california and some of those recreational markets at the moment when you have a big competition in the illicit, mar in the illicit market so it's challenging it's challenging times we all know that but I think you have to focus again on innovation. And this is times where you can come up with stuff where, where, where you can make a mark. We know in the last recession, call it, there was in 2008, there's a lot of great companies came out of it, like Uber or like Airbnb and stuff to make, took advantage of, 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 of this situation and had solutions which, which, which uh, uh, people benefited from. And then they've got a lot of traction and lots of new, new companies have been born in this. And I think, you have to see it here as well in Canada, in the cannabis industry. It's it's like that. You have to innovate. Back coming back to the stores, your original question, 
make sure the experience is right you treat your people well and have good good product good prices and the people will come back mm -hmm. yeah in washington we have uh, within a six mile radius there's two dozen stores you could literally go right next to one another without leaving the parking lot and yeah. within uh, a five minute drive there's literally two dozen stores right there so the competition is fierce and so i'm wondering with some of these changes if it's that's more of a traditional cue like what we're seeing right now if people are like oh i, I don't i want something to be more convenient i want about a location that's interesting because if cannabis is legal you would drive any amount like look at uh, what some of the illegal states are doing wisconsin and, and some of these other places going to illinois i'm wondering if this is just an indication that cannabis is maybe normalizing do you see this is where consumers are just basing their purchases on traditional cues like price and convenience 100 percent, 100 percent. i think uh, that's why i mentioned the online the online gives them the possibility to really compare efficiently, very quickly, very quickly, where's the best deal, where's my product I like the most, and can compare it very, very efficiently. So that's that's key that you have that experience, right? And then like be better than others. And, the, and I call it frictionless. So so the fr frictionless experiences is key to to get your customers. Uh, if you have to wait long, or if you if you have to. If you if you don't really find a place, if there's no good parking and all that indicates like, OK, I'm not I'm going to this other place and maybe drive three minutes more, but I go to the other place. So you got to the online is really helping, helping people to make those very efficient decisions. Uh, and then they go where they get the best deal. And, and 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 that's OK. But then the experience again, the experience has to be right in that store. You have to you have to the people you have to get them back in the store. So that's important when they either they want an efficient checkout or they want like talk about stuff. And this we, uh, and I'm, the last thing I think I said this in our last interview as well, it's so important to not forget the medical, the original medical patients in, in, in those markets. And even if the state turns recreational, you got to respect them. You got to give them priority. You got to make sure this is not like a price game where they take an advantage of it. This is really people who need the medicine. It's, uh, and, and, and this is what we're always trying to make sure. And we're very well trained with that. We have in Pennsylvania, we have very good dispensaries. We have a, still a pharmacist on staff and you can have your, your meeting and you can talk about the various intake methods, which would be best for you. But as well, you have the hipster butt tender uh, there and you, you can just tell you, okay, that's, that's, that's cool. And you, so you have both the, the best of two worlds in one place. I think that's why it's called Beyond Hello as well, because we, we want to go a little bit beyond the just, okay, hi and goodbye, right? So... <laughs> This is how we set it up. I say, but I want to say, keep that, keep that as well. I saw it in Illinois. You were mentioning Illinois. In Illinois, we, I was part of switching to recreational with our stores there, and this is, was a very important aspect of it. You know, you cannot never, never, never just okay. It's now all fun, and my medical patients have to be in this long line around three blocks, and they don't get their medicine. It cannot happen. So we have to make sure this is always super respected and make that journey for them the most efficient and frictionless. So that's what we do online and brick and mortar, of course. Yeah, I definitely like um, you, if, if you take a look at the medical marijuana states like Washington, you'll notice that they just become tourist weed. Um, it's really hard here finding any kind of real decent quality. A lot of people in Washington that were medical have gone back to the legacy markets. And I'm actually thinking about going and getting my product from them because I'm just tired of the lack of consistency, lack of availability, and lack of quality is, is yeah. huge. And I have to still filter by price and THC. I can go to a new state or newer state like Vegas and, and filter by the effects. I can go and see yeah. what kind of terpenes I want. So That's it's really right. frustrating on, on that experience. And so it's it's not very enjoyable. I'm wondering what your vision is uh, when providing an enjoyable experience. Back to the BDS Analytics report, 16% cited that an in-store experience determines their favorite dispensary. And one in four people said that they wanted an enjoyable experience. I don't really know what that means, but what is your vision in trying to provide that enjoyable in-store experience? Well, that's, this is interesting because there's now the current... So I think, I think, look at the cannabis industry. Look at like... Look what let Madman was an interesting example. Madman kind of set the standards and they, they built those great stores and they had like one-on-one -on -one sessions and they were very good customer service, very cool looking stores. They kind of tried with that experience, normalize cannabis. So I think people went a little bit too far as well with that idea because 
the 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 it's not an Apple store. You don't sell iPads for thousand dollars. You have to find the right balance. How much service you can give. However, it's so, so important that to have the new people, the people who 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 have the first time they experience. They have to be really like guided well, and they, they have to make them comfortable because it's a new thing. It's very intimidating to go into a store like that. So, so I think that has to be focused on. But then you have to as well offer like really for the for the current. Uh, and and future um, com competitive state state of things or a competitive environment, you have to offer like very efficient checkout methods. People who like have been coming three or four times, they know what they want. They not necessarily want the in-store experience and all the talk. They want their stuff. They know already. They want the gummies. They want this gummies. They want that sleep gummy and and that this and that. So so you have to satisfy those two profile or personas at all times. But don't go too far and don't out outperform you and have too much fun in the stores right because that cannot be profitable in long term and i think we have to a little bit cut back and customer as well they have to understand that this is not like always can be a one and one session and you can ask all the questions all the time because the, the product is not expensive enough for that you cannot afford that as a as a retailer really to do all that but however smart ways have to be found to to satisfy specifically the new the newbies who come and they need they need that session so so i think you have to find the balance between business otherwise the store is going to be not around if you have like 10 people standing in there and, and everybody's ready for a one-on-one -on -one session that cannot survive long term right that might be surviving on some investor money for a while and like <laughs> you're not going to have a good business so find the right balance but provide a good service and 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 know your people right and 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 what they want and and you can learn a lot on data with that and so that's what we do you look at the data you know look at the data yeah i think there's a happy medium between a library that's boring and then maybe like a mall uh, store that's really loud and too much perfume and yeah. whatever i mean there's there that's an experience it's not the one i want uh, but you know, there, I think there's a happy medium for, for different types of folks. 100%. And it's like, you know, you can say life. We have done a lot of stuff. We, we had, we had a lifestyle concert. We have like, we're selling other stuff. I, we have collaborations with artists. We've like, I did this collaboration with, with Colin Hanks, my friend who has, who has this, this bandana line. We're selling this, this in the store. So we're adding products as well, which are not cannabis related to the experience, which was an interesting. It's an interesting, uh, um, uh, experiment, I call it got to learn from it and you got to make sure these these products are relevant not necessary always they have to be like vapes and or like or like boxes you put cannabis in it can be related but it can be as well lifestyle stuff so you have to try this out i think the future will go a little bit there but you have to focus people really want to have their medicine either or they want to have their product efficient fast if they have questions they have to be answered professionally but don't have them wait around the store for like one half hours and, and, and with, with all kinds of stuff and slow checkouts and filling out forms and stuff. You really have to streamline this experience. Yeah, I want to get to that eventually too because I think Amazon lockers are going to be awesome in the future, but it takes away from that in-store experience. We'll get to that. First off, delivery. Florida customers are one of the biggest um, um, users, I guess, of, of delivery. So back to that BDS analytics report, 23%. That's almost one in four so that delivery was the determining factor in determining their favorite dispensary. <laughs> so what's your response when consumers are skipping that in-store option? Yeah, I mean, this. so the, the world has changed after COVID, right? So even even the, the last the last one who, who wouldn't order and like wants to go to the store, have at some point, okay, hey, now I cannot go leave my house. I have to order something. So a little bit, the, so the, the, the habit has changed. The world has changed on that aspect. However, it's, uh, I, I feel it's, it, so for, from our perspective, it's very challenging to be have a profitable business on delivery because it's secure, it's driving. You have there has to be secure, it has to has to be cameras in there, and like it's, there's a lot of. If you do it right, it's very hard to make this a profitable thing, and and we don't really want to just charge so much more to our customers because of the delivery. So you have to find the right balance for it. I think delivery is a great thing. However, um, the, the 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 friction is really. I order something and then somebody comes to your house and then you have to you rig their rings the bell and he has a bag of something you ordered and then my daughter opens the door with and who is this person that you have to show your ID and the, it's all it's still it's like alcohol delivery right if you have to show your if you show your um, 
ID, it's it's a big friction point, I think, and and, and it's. I, I, I hear the I hear the data saying in, in Florida, for example, this twenty three percent is 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 a lot, but I think um, we got to find a way how to make this more frictionless this experience, and there will be concepts coming. I think we're not quite there yet uh, in delivery. It's it's a little bit early. It's it's a it's a specialist thing, uh, and of course the the looser the regulations, the easier it is. But if you we do a lot of delivery in Vegas, for example. You know, and then in Vegas, I have the problem. You cannot deliver to hotels. It has to be a private address. So, you know, all that kind of regular is still like very, very um, tough, right? Cutting out a lot of a lot of opportunities for, for delivery. So um, it's definitely, it, it, it is the future. You, you mentioned Amazon lockers. It's as well. I think this is a good, good, good example. Like you, you, you maybe want to create like stores, which are, drive through only, express only, and as less human interaction as possible as pickup hubs. When really it gets more advanced and people really know what they want, then I want to pick up my wild gummies. I want to pick up my testology gummies. I order them online. They're going to be in the locker and pick it up and take it as all safe. Um, I think that's definitely the future, but we, slowly but surely, still too much too much friction. It's hard to build profitable businesses with that. It has, it has to be, I'm saying, from our perspective, because we have to give the customer a great experience at a great price. So that's very hard, right? Without losing money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the trick. Well, um, there's going to be, I mean, it's new for every everything, everyone. It's still very, very early in the game. Uh, so when additional competition does come online um, and compete against stores like Beyond Hello, I think that's going to prompt a lot of in-store experiences to, to compete against. Could the legal limitations, however, on displaying products make online ordering even a larger factor? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you kind of counter that trend? Because Washington State has 1,700 products all displayed. You go to Vegas, none of them are displayed. You have an iPad. Different experiences, different um, intimidation factors. Yeah. Um, and so kind of when you have limitations on being able to display it, is, is that going to create more online ordering? What's your take and how do you address so, that? So it, it, it's an inter interesting question because I can see, so, you know, the, the newer markets, the East coast markets like Virginia, Illinois, Pennsylvania, they have been trained from the beginning on online pre-order, right? It's like, and they have been, they've been shown because the other States, they, they, they didn't have that. There was no online period. You had to go to the store. So these hmm. stores, they have been they have been launched with online. So people see on the menus and the, the photos are getting better. The strain photos getting better. Better the the product photos getting better. It's it's like the it's the juicy hammer. You get mouth watering pictures of of uh, on our menus. If you go to our menus, you get really mouth watering pictures of flour. And it's the real flour. We make sure we go to this grow. We shoot the exact strain. Always, when it comes out from a new harvest, and this is this is what you see on on our menus. This is like the hamburger with the melting cheese on it, so the the flour and the crystals. That is what I think. That's even a better experience sometimes than going to the store. When, as you said, it's like it says behind the wall. We like we kind of counter different regulations. You cannot see anything. Some some in Pennsylvania, some stores you cannot. Nobody has ever seen what's in there, right? Because it arrives secure from the from the GP. Then it's it's all in in air air and light tight uh, packaging. So mm -hmm. nobody ever sees the, the product until they open it at home. Not even the butt tender, right? The butt tender, of course, have, has the opportunity to go to the, maybe to the GP and have a tour and see what's going on, coming from the harvest, but not really exactly see what's in that thing. You cannot look at it, it's not allowed to. So it's key to have those good photography and 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 be real with it. It has to be the real thing and, and, and put it on and that's, and not the packaging, really. It's like it's it's all about the product. I think it's important to do that, right? So, so to, to answer your question, I think the online e experience in those markets it's even better than the store. And then you go to the store, then you actually okay, I trust you. This is this will be in this box because I'm not never going to see it until I go at home. So I think that's important. So until we can show stuff in the store, like in Nevada, of course, you go in the store, like in our one of our, our stores, you, you go in there and then it's like a French bistro. You have the shelves, like it looks like you know, just the flour is all on the shelves, like in the, in the, like the croissants in the bakery, right? Yeah, right. So that's, that's, the, that's a great way to do it as well, but it's not possible everywhere. So 
bottom line, uh, both experiences have to be top notch. If you limit it by regulations in store, then you have to make sure your online experience shows 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 the shows the mouse watering images mm -hmm. of the stuff. Mm -hmm. What else does it take to become a favorite dispensary? There's location, lowest price, variety of products. Those are all factors driving dispensary favoritism along loyal consumers, including reward programs, number of strains available, product promotions. I mentioned that I'd like to see an improved filter to really kind of narrow down a particular cultivar, for example. But what else, in your opinion, Dre, does it take to become a favorite dispensary? Favorite dispensary. So uh, I think you missed out one. It's always our, our main one. So our stores, if you look at them, uh, our new stores, they're always freestanding, have good parking. Parking is an, am it's an amazingly important thing for people. Uh, and, and you cannot underestimate. It's even like something we, have, we, we, will ad we would advertise parking, right? It's an interesting little detail. But people love parking and they don't have to walk too much. And specifically in the East Coast, it's raining or something. So it has to be good parking. Um, and then and efficient, it has to be, it has to be frictionless in and out you know most people want this fast they want to go they want to go in they already pre-order their stuff they want it fast they want to pay fast and ideally they would pay already online which is partly possible with some workarounds and you can you can do that now so so again again create the most frictionless experience for your customer and and they will and and they they will come and they will they will prefer you to others where you have to wait around and nothing's moving. Uh, and there's a lot of those because specifically in the, if you, if you don't have your game down in those very regulated medical markets, then you, you could, you could end up in filling out forms and sitting it's like a doctor's office sometimes. Right. So mm -hmm. you have to make sure this is all frictionless. This is our thing. We are very big on customer experience and user experience, you know, from digital to brick and mortar. So this has to be one, themeless fr fr frictionless experience and we always find them again you cannot audit enough like the, you always find new frictions they're, they're the gold kind of even like you find and when you, you remove that then you see it oh wow you have more customers more transactions and more happy people and better result, better reviews mm -hmm. is there room for uh patients and and frequent users in the adult use space we're seeing like cannabis dispensaries are overwhelming, intimidating. Like I mentioned, 1,800 products in Washington right when you walk in. Data yeah. showing that news, new users, they appreciate that customer service and bud tender help that they get. And then um, in addition to investing in customer service and knowledgeable, friendly bud tenders, that kind of really helps with those newbies. But yeah. with the loyal, um, you know, heavy smokers and patients... What's going to make the difference in attracting and keeping those people? Yeah, you have to, you have to respect them. You have to treat them well. They, they, you know them, you know them already by name, and you have to make sure. I think in the future, you mentioned the loyalty programs. So all these these loyalty programs, they have they have functionalities like, which I always see. I always look at it like you have this this piece of software software service, and then you need you not only need that, you need a good. It's like compared with a with a good piano. If you don't have a good piano player, then the piano will not sound like like anything. So you really need need to to play this well. And, and why I'm saying that here in this in this question is there is for 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 people who are in the loyalty program and they come back, we have the data. What are they? What are they? What they like? And then you have to start personalizing ah this is this is bill he, he always gets that let the let him he always gets the vapes and he, he, give him give him something he really like you know him you have to you have to know him already from mm -hmm. as well from data right and you have to give him stuff and give give him better deals on things we know he likes they will appreciate that you know there's like a mm -hmm. it's like a being part of the family basically and we know bill we know what you want here have another vape because you like vape so much you know we know him here's your birthday and all the all the all the the, the normal things the outside world is doing on retail right like you get your birthday card and all that you have to look at the data and data is still very difficult in cannabis right it's very scattered around through all the man state mandatory prs systems and then and you have another system on top and you have jane on top and all the data is in different places so you have to make sure always to 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 streamline that really have have play play your play your loyalty program right 
and give the right people the right stuff, right? So that's, I think that's the key, if, if that answers your question. Mm. Yeah, let's check out the, um, let's go to the, the Amazon locker as the kind of the final question because those frequent users, they just kind of want those bud tenders out of the way. Uh, maybe if they're available to answer a quick question, whatever. Um, but personally, I'd like to settle for an Amazon locker. There's pre-order online and you get your own line, just like a medical patient in some states get their own line to get them in and out as quickly as possible. Yet those lines can still take forever uh, I know there's regulatory hurdles in terms of being able to put it in a locker and, and all of those issues. I'm, I know it, it gets away from that interaction. It gets away from, um, you know, being in the store. Too. Yeah. But for a place like Washington, that still doesn't have delivery. I just want to get my product as fast as possible. If I had delivery, I'd be consuming even more product. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm just curious what that would look like. Um, do you, how do you draw people in like me? So you, you would be the classic like ex express checkout. You know, we have in all our stores, we have like the sales floor and then you have like always the express checkout with online pre-order. And so how, how, how you do this, we have one store, for example, a good example in, in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts in a place called Tingsboro, which is our, one of our highest performing stores, uh, tons of transactions. And uh, this, this store has been opened. And this is the interesting thing where I'm saying it, mandatory by state has been opened uh, and it was online only during the pandemic. So we learned a lot there because this store, nobody was ever allowed to go in the store. So we worked out a system there like yeah, this is all curbside, people arriving. There was like, and there's, there's thousands of transactions in the store every day. We call it the train station. So we still practice the same because the people have been literally trained they want it like that far. It's exactly that's you. You want to drive there. You want to already pre-order it. You want to pay quickly and get a, get away again. And that is what that store is doing all day long. And we 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 really we're really looking at that store. We're sending our UX experts there. They they're observing how this store is doing it. This is all lined up. There's all the pre-packaged orders inside. They're using basically the sales floor to to prep to stage for deliver uh, for curbside, right? So there's, mm -hmm. there's green buttons, red buttons, so the, the three to four pickup, the five to six pickup, the eight to 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. pickup. They have all different colors and it flies out. I think it's a, it's a two, minute, two minute thing or some two to three minute thing if you have pre-ordered. So it, that's what you have to work on, right? And this is like not easy. As you said, with all the regulation, how can you do that? But it's possible. And, 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 and COVID has, has helped there a little bit. And train the consumer to do to do online, right? And then and these guys they they don't really come to the store. Now the store is open, but what what happens? They're still online. Uh oh, send them new stuff at the at the. And I say this purposely. Up, I say upsell because it's, it is upsell. So it's like, but upsell is a good thing, right? You they can show you, you get your stuff you order, but you can show you as well. Ah, here's something new and. And I know you and you will like this, you know, and that's where the data comes in again. You have to know these guys. And then all this, all this is still in the, in, in, in early, early days with data, but the, the more you can get this and the more efficient will be and the more you will get as well. Then on top of the quick execution of your transaction, you get like on top of it, still the newest stuff, which you maybe have, haven't found online or you haven't seen it as a promotion. We don't know about you missed out. And then you can get benefit from that as well in store. So I think this is how you have to play it. For you, this is like a express checkout curbside business, like online mm -hmm. pre-order. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, all right, Dre Neumann, you're the chief uh, creative officer with Jushi Holdings. You guys are on uh, OTC Markets under ticker symbol J-U-S-H-F. Where else can they find you at? Uh, Jushico.com. Uh, so Jushi is uh, sushi, sushi with a J and then C-O, Jushico.com. And uh, there's really like from there you can spread out into into the into the digital digital kingdom of Jushi and Jushi I don't know where if you know where the name came from but the CEO CEO Jim Kachiopo has actually invented the name himself and he he named it after this old two thousand year old Chinese kingdom where they found an emperor a uh, thousand years later uh, buried in, in 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 cannabis leaves so this is where Jushi. So it's a cool thing. So jushico.com. 
Yeah, I, I, I should have asked Jim uh, when he was on the podcast. I didn't even ask him what the name was. I just assumed he made it up. <laughs> he made, right. yeah, but he was, he, he was, this was, there was, sometimes it happens in very fast. You know, you can look for names forever and then you're not happy, but he did it like fast and he had a story and the story is brilliant. And uh, I cannot wait to travel to the, to the Jushi kingdom. <laughs> One <day. laughs> All right. I think with that, though, we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guest, Dre Neumann, Chief uh, Creative Officer, which you, she appreciates you being back on The Talking Hedge. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Dre. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. <laughs>